Mike Gass, from the Jim Fannin Show. Dan McTeague is the president of Canadians for an Affordable Energy. He's an MP, liberal MP from 93 to 11. You can check him out at gaswisdom.com or right here on your screen, Canadians for Affordable Energy.ca on Facebook. Welcome aboard. Mr. McTeague, I appreciate your time. Thanks for taking it, man. I know you're probably it's good busy. to be here, Jim. Yeah, thanks for having me today. Your thoughts, I mean, because I think most people know you. I don't think you can go certainly go into a little bit of bio if it if it's relevant to what we're talking about. But thoughts on today's political machinations. So, what do you what are you seeing in today's climate of? Well, we'll tell you anything, and then when we get elected, we'll turn around and do the other thing. Your thoughts on the election? What's well, that old Simon Garfunkel song? Uh, any you know, Mrs. Robinson? Any you know? You laugh about it, cry about it. Any way you look, you lose. Um, <laughs> you don't really have much uh, in the way of choice. You probably do, and it depends on your perspectives. But an election which obviously was never needed to begin with and really was more of a vanity ride for the prime minister, uh, a fellow who obviously uh, misread uh, the polls and certainly uh, the tea leaves. Uh, I suspect that if there was any point at this stage, it's that they are spinning, uh, that is the government is spinning and trying to find a way to, uh, you know, to really uh, staunch the, uh, the bleeding of its support. Um, you know, I've been in every election up to 20, uh, 2011, certainly as a candidate um, or as a campaign manager or as a canvasser or as a sign poster going back to 1978 for the Liberal Party. Um, this probably is as scary as the ones the Liberals experienced in 2011, in which, uh, they're seeing uh, their main rival, the uh, Conservative Party, uh, raise, you know, rise in, in terms of support, while at the same time watching uh, the NDP continue to gnaw away at their, at their base of support. So I, I suspect for the Liberals, not a great time. Uh, for the Conservatives, uh, perhaps uh, uh, you know, a bit of a surge ahead, but perhaps also looking at the numbers and saying, you know, we're not much better than we were under our previous leader, uh, Andrew Scheer. And I think for the other parties uh, beyond the NDP, um, the PVC, and of course the Maverick Party, opportunity, uh, hope. Uh, nothing, I think, uh, too serious in terms of any major breakthroughs, but knowing that um, their vote catch could very well affect uh, the outcome of uh, the election. I think perhaps even make this a hung parliament, in which case we'll be back and at it again. The difference, however, is that um, because of the way in which our system works, our, our financing system, uh, if you've gone from 1% of support to 4% of support, that means you have a lot of more resources to work with. Uh, and if the election's only 18 months away, if Justin Trudeau gets his way, um, then we could be looking at a much stronger catch for uh, you know uh, so-called outside parties. Hard to say where this is going to go, but I think... Uh, given that there's less than two weeks now in the election. Um, it doesn't look like the governing Liberals uh, may be able to ha maintain power. If they do, it will be by the skin of their proverbial teeth, um, with the Conservatives uh, perhaps, uh, again, a much stronger opposition than we've ever seen in the past. I guess the real issue is not what the campaign yields, but what Canadians will have to face. We'll finally see the government have to uh, raise the white flag and say, we've overspent. The finances of the country are terrible. Inflation is likely going to be out of control. Growth is not there. Unemployed, unemployment will grow. Um, interest rates may very well be uh, next in line. And of course, finances. There is no money. Uh, there's no money to pay for new programs and we can't continue to borrow more than we've already borrowed and committed. And so for that reason, uh, I think the election is, uh, is really just a uh, you know, a, a symbol. Uh, it's it's uh, the last, if you will, last chance saloon, I think, for Canadians before they really visit a federal government that is going to have to be honest about the numbers and uh, present to us, uh, you know, numbers that show that we're heading to a, a likely recession. And that will be one that uh, could be a lot worse than anything we've seen in recent memory. Dan P McTeague is my guest. Dan, tell me, geez, you were elected in the first year I was recruited by Greg Vesna. I don't know if you know Vesna. Oh, yeah. I know Greg, yeah. He's in the... Uh, the 
alternative fuels with uh, NH3 gas. That was with ammonia. Stuff too. Yeah. Pardon me? No, ammonia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, nobody smarter. But back in 93, when Maroonie said, well, we're, we're going to cancel all the small parties if you don't run 50, par- uh, 50 candidates, I was recruited with stage fright. And you were elected <laughs> that same year that I ran in 24 as a total neophyte and a green. I've been red pilled, as we talked a little bit about off air before we started here since uh, 2015. Tell me a little bit. You st- you've always sound really objective to me when I listen to you on 610 CKTV when you used to be a regular guest there. You used to, uh, it sounded to me like you're very objective. Tell me what it's been like staying loyal to the liberal ideology, if you have, and especially since 2015 when they seem to have gone mad. Like I, I used to really rile with the left because they stood for freedom <laughs> and, uh, you know, no war and free speech. But now they just abandoned all the issues I'm passionate about. Tell me about your experience with the left. Well, it may not be less different than yours, but look, I think uh, 2011, the Liberal Party, as we knew it, passed away. It died. Um, a lot of good people went with it. And... Uh, the Liberal Party took the position that, it, uh, you know, rather than simply, you know, uh, ridding itself of its existence, as pe- people like uh, well-known authors, Peter C. Newman, wrote off the Liberal Party and said, that's it, it's over. Um, liberals uh, moved towards, uh, you know, a rock star. Uh, and the only name they knew that uh, would resonate with people, um, apart from the fact he was young, uh, they went with Justin Trudeau, and overwhelmingly so, so much so that even as the Liberal Party had you know, switch from Ignatieff over to Bob Ray after the 2011 election. Uh, Ray had every intention of running in a leadership to formalize his uh, his his coronation, and would run in the next election to take on uh, Stephen Harper um, in 2015. But that all came to an end when Trudeau threw his hat in the race, and uh, it became, uh, you know, a sort of inevitable what the outcome would be. The Liberal Party um, lurched financially and dramatically to the left. Um, some people, of course, like myself, might have been all over the map on economics. I might have been center, center left on social issues, perhaps center right. But I always knew the Liberal Party was a big tent party, so it accommodated a lot of people's disparate views, regional interests, and some local issues. So, you know, my time as an MP was spent more trying to pass private members' bills, and uh, thankfully, I, I probably broke the record. Um, very few MPs have been able to do what I was able to do, but I knew the system, having went back to my days in 1981, 82, 83, working for liberal cabinet ministers, uh, liberal MPs, liberal candidates. Um, I had a pretty good idea of how, you know, how uh, the system operated and I knew the ropes. So that helped. But 2015, I think for a lot of us, was um, a point at which we could no longer recognize the party we had become part of. And we're told very bluntly, uh, it was an issue of age. You're over 45, we're not interested. You're not a female, we're not interested. Um, you know, you don't swear loyalty to the leader, we're not interested, which is kind of bizarre because most leaders were strong enough to uh, to push back on any type of dissent or any, you know, on, on popular positions. And if they saw it's a good position, like Trudeau's father, Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, if you were strong in principle and could effectively argue your point, he'd back off. And he did that even in the constitutional fight going back to 1982. A lot of people forget about this because it was, you know, eons ago. But I was there, a young, funny politician at the time. Um, the Liberal Party became more morphed into, and you've heard other people say this, but I, I, I certainly think it's it's correct, a cult of personality. Uh, it became more involved with uh, more uh, repressive ideas of, you know, squelching dissent, freedom of ideas and thought and conscience. Uh, no longer was there to be a debate. In fact, the caucus that we know that was elected in 2015 uh, permitted the Prime Minister's office staff to attend every week and take notes on who is being good and who is being bad. Wouldn't let members of Parliament speak on their own, even if it was their own initiatives. They wouldn't be allowed to speak to the media, speak to anything without the approval of uh, the Prime Minister's office. So, in effect, uh, reducing our democracy to you know uh, the one-man show, the one-man dog and pony show. Uh, of course, you know we can talk about uh, cultural, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity politics. We can talk about virtue signaling, all of those things Mr. Trudeau perfected, but uh, ultimately the Liberal Party of today is, you know, a a shadow of its uh, former self. And it's for that reason that it cannot possibly hope to represent um, the the broad spectrum, if you will, the consensus, the word that the Liberal Party has completely forgotten under this Justin Trudeau doesn't exist. And I think that's the big shift that we saw take place in 2015. It's left a lot of guys like myself 
uh, you know, on the sidelines. And uh, some of us choose not to be silent. And I warned Justin Trudeau personally, I'm not going to be silent. Um, I will not go away simply because you have temporary, you know, ownership of the Liberal Party. Your father earned it. I respected him. I worked for him. You have not. Amen. Yeah, he really rode the coattails. And, and he is, well, I, I always say, disparagingly, uh, appropriately, I guess, too, is, you know, he's his mother's son, not his father's. Uh, but he has put very good, wise people around him that know how to get elected, that understand politics. So, you know, part of being a good politician, even if you can't carry a normal conversation with a human being without a script, is knowing how to get elected. And he's done that. You know, uh, Dan, I really appreciate your thoughts. I want to get to energy, but I really appreciate your yep. thoughts because you've been around politics for so long. Uh, and, you know, I'm kind of as a new righty over the last five or six years <laughs> and very organically came to the moderate right, you know, on guns and immigration and taxes and freedoms and free speech. Uh, you know, this is my seventh YouTube channel. You know, I just started making money and then I was disappeared for no reason. My only <laughs> hope is that we've never seen an election where we had people locked down for 18 months, that there's a pent up, a pent up a anger. I call it an, a, a volatile electorate that will do surprising things. And I'm, you know, there's not too many people talking about electoral reform and proportional representation. I think Max has actually missed an opportunity there to appeal to the conservatives that want some sort of electoral reform. Because if he if he manages to pull off a miracle, which I would say would be, you know, 10, 15 percent and getting his seat, or maybe even electing a couple of people, what do you think the possibility is that we could be sitting here on the 21st of September, not with a majority liberal government, but maybe a liberal government reduced to two seats like Kim Campbell was, that people are really going to punish Trudeau regardless of the polls, and that we will have some hope when we wake up you know, the next day, if they, if there's a government in place, uh, whether it be, you know, minority or majority, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, that the electorate is pent up, they're angry and they will do some weird things. And we might be sitting here looking at a reform party or hell, you remember uh, Bob Ray was elected in Ontario. Even he didn't expect that. What do you think the chances are for a, a big surprise this time around? Well, I think they're very good. Um, discounting the fact that many people may not get out to vote. But the uh, the overarching continues to be and it surprises me because I you know I've always taken the view that once election is called people just simply fall in line and you know okay the election's called let's deal with the fact uh, with the facts before us and don't worry about the fact that it was called I, there's a lot of stickiness um, I'm not seeing a lot of teams out there canvassing I I'm in a liberal held riding here in the GTA in uh, Burlington North Oakville um, not seeing a lot of activity uh, post uh, writ. Uh, the day the election was called from uh, the Liberals. Uh, I'm seeing some activity from the Conservatives. But other than that, this is uh, considered a, a bit of a swing riding. And so, you know, the Liberals are not, uh, uh, the Liberals, I think, are shell-shocked. At least their candidates are. And we have to admit that, that uh, they've run a terrible campaign. Not only were they not able to explain to people why uh, they called the election, but uh, the fact is that they've had two to three weeks of uh, you know, gaffes almost by the day. And so for that reason, I think it's going to hurt the Liberals. I don't think it's going to cause them uh, to disappear. Uh, as in a 1993, you know, uh, conservative, progressive conservative meltdown, as we saw with Shadow and uh, with my old friend, uh, Elsie Wayne, uh, who became the only two survivors of that uh, 1993 maelstrom. Um, but I do think it's uh, very similar to what I saw in terms of uh, the public being a little fed up, tired of Justin Trudeau and his antics. Uh, the name Trudeau is not a great name anymore, and he's done a lot to create division and rancor. Um, if all you have left now is uh, to call in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know Toronto and and uh, and Montreal as your you know as your uh, as your as your fortresses, you may find that those two could be could could be compromised. But I don't think that unfortunately, I don't think the Conservatives have been able to capitalize on it. I think the problem for uh, Mr. O'Toole is that he tried to become liberal light on on issues like climate, um, on you know uh, other very important issues as well. And so for that reason, it's kind of important I think for people to recognize that the uh, uh, while it's difficult to say what the outcome is going to be, I think Nova Scotia is weighing very much in the minds of a lot of liberals right now. Um, the fact that uh, they walked in that guaranteed a majority and wound up. Of, uh, getting shellacked. Uh, so anything's possible, especially when the public is holding its, 
holding its views very close to its chest. I think uh, we're going to see a bit of an upset, not a terrible one, uh, but we're going to be back at this perhaps in as little as a year, year and a half, unless someone's got a better idea, because I know that the traditional left parties, the NDP, the Green, if they manage to get a seat or two, um, and the Bloc uh, won't necessarily play, you know, footsies. Uh, with a conservative government should they happen to get the mm -hmm. lion's share of seats. Yeah, I'm surprised. I feel like at any other time, and times have really changed, and I've been surprised by so many things that are going on, and so many times I'm looking at our lives and going, can you believe we're here now? We're, we're actually entertaining these ideas? Much of what Trudeau has done since the writ was dropped, and even before, would normally be campaign, would be political suicide. Like yeah. the vaccine passports, the limited limit, uh, limitation of freedoms and liberties. I mean, I don't see how this kid comes through this without being severely punished. But there is, a, you know, a huge liberal voter base that just won't turn off. Right. So, yeah, I, I just don't think the liberal base is compelled to vote anymore. I mean, uh, uh, what I'm tra really trying to come after, and for, regardless of what I think of Justin Trudeau, I'm still trying to figure out why the election was called. Um, he had a functional ma minority, um, a strong minority. Um, he wasn't getting any pushback on very many issues. He may not have liked some of the coverage he was getting, but it's pretty clear to me that I was getting calls here at the House, you know, <laughs> uh, from pollsters saying if 60% uh, of Canadians are vaccinated by the end of, uh, I think at that time, at the end of March, would you be willing to vote Liberal? So it's pretty clear to me what they were really trying to do. They were going to say, listen, if we spring out of this, we do very well. Cashing in on, you know, uh, the goodwill of what you've been able to accomplish through billions of dollars that we've spent. We have no idea how that, you know, how that came down. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really dramatically lost on some pretty bad faux pas. If you're going to use it for partisan political reasons, then I think public will, will push back. And a little bit of experience here, Jim, and I won't be long with this. I serve the role of protecting Canadians abroad from 2003 to 2006 under the Paul Martin government. And uh, it was made very clear to me, the Prime Minister, this was not a partisan issue. And you reached out and you talked to members of Parliament on the other side. And I did. And during the election, although I should have lost my job as a Parliamentary Secretary, uh, it was agreed by all parties that I continued my job right up until the election until we were defeated at that time. But uh, the point is, I think the Prime Minister has uh, has got this tendency um not just to beat his opposition but to try to decimate them and destroy them uh, and because he is so prone to uh you know to moving uh, in the direction of radical ideals um he tends to think that maybe the people around him are not telling the truth perhaps uh he believes so much in his uh, views that the rest of the world has to fall in line i think he's in for a very serious rude awakening and i think for the liberal party um a chance for reflection because if what they're really doing here is all right trudeau fails we're just going to get mark carney to become the next leader and we'll just go down this road of climate change alarmism what i call climate bedwetting you're going to lose canadians because a lot of canadians may be at a point where you're going to be losing their homes they're going to be losing their livelihood they're going to be losing their ability to make ends meet they're going to be losing their ability uh to put decent food on the table we are at a, a significant crossroads and uh it's not made any better by what where Trudeau has brought us. The last thing we need, need to do is elect another liberal leader who's going to just double down and do the exact same thing uh, in the interests of a handful of folks. Ironically, the same kind of uh, business leadership that took advantage of Americans back in 2008 and caused the 2008 uh, global economic recession by, uh, uh, you know, by uh, in putting money towards uh, certain unproductive ends such as carbon credits. And that market is, we can talk about it later, but if that's where we're going in the Liberal Party, then uh, I guess I got my, my, my work cut out for me for the next several years. Okay, pol another political question that crosses over into your area of expertise. You're elected the President of Canada with an executive order or a whole bunch of executive orders. I know this is kind of fantasy, but what do you put in place for the country energy-wise? I make it pretty clear that energy, uh, the oil and gas sectors are number one. Uh, uh, breadwinner and that uh, our economic viability counts on its success at a time in which demand is re increasing not decreasing at a time in which people are not able to make ends meet at a time in which uh, we're seeing <clears throat> in critical investments leaving this country because they're not leaving to go buy <coughs> windmills or or solar panels in another country they're going to invest in oil and gas in another jurisdiction of the world so 
rather than dealing with the world of magic and make-believe in which you like the international energy agency or joe biden go around saying oh we can get rid of all this stuff and then beg opec as you did embarrassingly a couple of weeks ago to produce more oil and in canada uh and, and and the government of canada has to start to say the canadian interest isn't about bending over backwards to every tom dick and harry that comes out and protests it's about once a court has made a decision standing up for our pipelines standing up for our infrastructure and creating an east-west uh, uh, corridor in which we can move energy either way and i'm not just starting that's not just oil and gas it's also electricity uh, we need to do more within our country to be able to provide and to serve our own interests otherwise we wind up in a situation of financial ruin the likes of which uh, as i said earlier the country has never faced in the past but is about to and i only have people look at you know i keep my natural gas bills not too far from me it may be lost on people that natural gas prices are going to be double what they were last year. Let me reiterate that. The cost of natural gas in the market was about 2.3 or 2.30 an MBTU. Um, this year it's about 4.70. Uh, the cost of electricity, uh, it doesn't matter which province you're in, with the exception of maybe Quebec, which has subsidized uh, hydro. Most provinces have seen a one-third increase. Uh, in the in the cost of electricity. Uh, we're going to see a federal government supported by all parties that sit in the House of Commons right now, so not after the election, but right now, who support a clean fuel standard. That's going to add 15 cents a litre come January 1st, 2023, uh, plus HST or GST, depending where you are in the country, and 18 cents a litre for diesel. Sooner or later, all of these increases can only cause inflation, or they have to be responded to by consumers either getting higher wages or simply doing without. If they do without, then we see a, a dramatic decrease in our standard of living. And if we drive out the sectors like manufacturing, farming, and uh, and and agriculture and farming, and of course, most importantly, the oil and gas sector, what are you left with? You're left with a nation that uh, can't pay its own bills. If it can't pay and manage the billions, if not trillions of dollars now of debt that it's uh, incurred, um, what hospitals are you gonna close? Which teacher's jobs are gonna be affected? How many roads won't get fixed? What happens to our entire national infrastructure as it breaks apart? There won't be equalization payments for provinces like Quebec and others who have this tendency of saying no to certain types of projects while at the same time cashing in 10 to $13 billion a year. So I think we are quickly at a tipping point, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and if Canadians aren't willing to wake up, um, then perhaps it will require uh, you know, a call from the bailiff to get a lot of them to smarten up. So logistically then, you know politics well enough to strategize on some logistics that you could put in place. What are we talking about as far as scrapping carbon taxes? What Can we ever be energy independent in Canada? I know we don't have the refinery equipment for it. So obviously we're a worldwide leader in exporting our crude. But, yeah. uh, you know, you know, thoughts on energy independence and, and whatnot moving forward. Well, we are net exporters of refined product. Uh, just to make that clear, it's just that in certain regions of the country have a, a you know, it's unbalanced. British Columbia being a good example. Uh, the East Coast might start to be a bigger problem as far as places like Newfoundland, where they have no refineries in Nova Scotia. Uh, but I think the bigger issue is how do we make ends meet? Um, for me, the policies I think that we need to pursue is simple. If you believe this much in climate, then have one climate policy, have one carbon tax, not two. Let me let me really be clear about this. <clears throat> you are already seeing a, the, uh, the prime minister of the country break a campaign promise. As a layman, I would say lie about a promise uh, where he said it would no, go no higher the carbon tax on uh, on all fossil fuels from, uh, you know, at the time zero to fifty dollars a ton. He would not go beyond that. It's now 170 a ton. So let that work and let that be the incentive. If that's what you believe in, if that's what you think is going to be the way in which you bring about um, behavioral change, not just by industry, but most importantly, consumers. Remember, industry doesn't care as much. Industry doesn't care because they simply pass on the increases. But when you layer on a clean fuel standard, what I call the second carbon tax, and you come out and say, well, um, you know, uh, this is something that we want to do to get our, to meet our goals in 2030 and 2050 and other you know, aspirational nonsensical uh, uh, objectives. You have to take into consideration what economists, even purists, will 
William Nordhaus is a very well-known uh, climate economist. In fact, he got the Nobel Prize back a few years ago for his works. He said, no country that has a carbon tax should you know, force other forms of regulation <clears throat> on the industries that are intended to be the target. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> on industries that are intended to be the target. Um, with uh, you know additional burdens because what you do is you distort price discovery and what you're trying to uh, achieve with the first carbon tax. So right from the get go, that would be the first thing I get rid of. <clears throat> Unfortunately, NDP, conservative, liberal, um, uh, green and block all support the clean fuel standard, even though they have no idea how it's going to impact them. I do have a pretty good idea. I don't have it here in front of me, uh, but it is, uh, substantial and significant, and it will be devastating. Uh, that's what I would probably want to change first and foremost. <coughs> Talk to me about renewables. Uh, do they have a, a place here? You know, I mentioned Greg Vesna is an old friend of mine, knowledgeable. Been, yeah. I mean, in the 80s, he drove his Impala, which I rode in as dual fuel. It was NH3 and propane gas, and he drove that yeah. thing across the country with some MPs in the car, and just, you know, I think he's making some headway now, but, you know, he says the infrastructure's there because we have farmers that use ammonia, you know, you, the pipelines could, you know, move it as well. You know, talk to me about, you know, some of these alternatives. We've seen the wind uh, contracts and the graph that was included there. Talk to me a little bit about Vez's little baby, you know, using <laughs> ammonia, which is, uh, it, its exhaust is basically water vapor. I think I have one of Greg's uh, <laughs> discussions that I've, uh, I'm going to see if I can find it while we're talking. But one of the discussions I had with him not that long ago about how this works and how it would be most practical and I took copious notes uh, way, way back when he and I had uh, a chance to talk about this. Um, his is not invasive. His doesn't hurt consumers. His says, here's an, a technology that we can use that can do all the things you want to do without having to, uh, you know, without having to hurt people. And I think that's the beauty of what, uh, what he's proposed. We're using ammonia and it's, it's practical. I mean, I, I know expert like he is, but uh, for us to sidestep, the work that he's done um, and what he is saying, or simply trivialize it, uh, suggests to me that really what's happening in the case of Greg and many others, I think, who have great ideas on how to achieve this without punishing consumers. One of the great things I think we have to recognize is that who's benefiting? You, know, you touched on this in terms of, well, if I build a windmill, why am I paying 58 cents a kilowatt hour when in fact the market rate's only four or five? Who is making and taking advantage of these contracts? Uh, who's taking advantage of these subsidies? Who's taking advantage of these, uh, you know, these opportunities that are given by the taxpayer? And I think that's where the money is. Uh, uh, it's not lost on some people that, you know, we've got some people who've done very, very well by selling windmills in the province of Ontario, close friends of the former Liberal government, uh, many of whom, by the way, not just friends, but many of whom uh, the government members staffers now work for Trudeau in, in Ottawa. So my sense is that um, we're going to need to look a little wider and you know, pay a little bit more attention. If the goal is in fact that we believe that uh, the world is coming to an end as we know it, you and I have gray hair, we've heard this kind of nonsense before. Um, but even if we were to accept that it is true and it is going to happen, then I think the best way in which you do it is to make sure you get people on board. And as a politician, my every element of my DNA tells me that you work not just to telling people they should be clobbered over the head, but find a way in which you can get them on board without clobbering them on the head. And what you're doing now financially is hurting Canadians and you're hurting the Canadian uh, economy. Uh, and you're doing a lot of damage, not just in terms of economic and the economic financial consequences. You're also exploding the, the, the stability and the unity of the country. Uh, I, there's a lot of people who want this country gone, and I, I think that's not because they hate Canada. They hate the people directing it, and they have a lot of dis, you know, discomfort with the fact that you know we here in eastern Ontario tend to spend a lot of our time, for lack of a better term, and I can be as polemic as as, as uh, you know as uh, uh, erudite as I want, crapping on the West, and that's what it comes down to. Look. If a, people in Ontario, in my province, in my city, where I've never been out west, I've never, and I fought those folks all the time, especially the oil industry when I took them on in competition. If we in Ontario think so little natural gas and oil, then by all means, stop using it. 
but the use of fossil fuels is pervasive, it is ubiquitous, and thankfully in Canada is being done responsibly. Uh, so my sense is that uh, if you don't like natural gas and you want to follow these whole politicians saying turn off natural gas plants as backup when we had the huge heat waves we saw two weeks ago, without which we would not have had, we would have had brownouts here in Ontario. Then by all means, in the next uh, couple of months when the temperatures start to drop, take your wrench, I don't have one here, but I'd be glad to send it, but, and turn off your natural gas supply. Stop being a hypocrite, an eco-hypocrite above all. So if I were to say that, it's, you know, would I say that as a politician? You're damn right I would. Um, and it wouldn't be considered conventional, but look, I'm not trendy. I never have been. And I don't follow waves. I follow what's practical for most people. And I think that's uh, part, of the, part of the reason why I enjoyed my time as a member of Parliament. So I was free to say what I had to say. Coming back to that point, members of Parliament are not free. The word Parliament, to speak out, the parler en français comme on dit, no longer have the ability to speak up or speak out. They're worse than voting machines. They're toadies. And unfortunately, uh, Canadians are spending a lot of time worrying about which toady is going to represent them. And at the end of the day, um, representation is lost in this country to a large extent. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts? Greg always talks about triple bottom line accounting, cradle to grave accounting, the idea that we tax, and this is a Green Party policy as well, tax packaging, tax waste. Don't make us pay to recycle it. Just add the taxes on. So the idea that, you know, if the gasoline costs you three bucks a gallon to get to the to the pump and then it does another dollar fifty damage to the community health and the environment you tax it on yeah. at the you put it on at the pump and that levels the playing field for the cleaner fuels i know you can't do that overnight but what are your thoughts about the cradle to grave cost included in the purchase price well let's understand what that means because mitigation uh you know and and having a clean environment isn't something just happened overnight uh, you and I look at Lake Ontario. We look back at it 35, 40 years ago. It stunk. Fish were dying. Uh, these were the great dead lakes. Uh, they're not anymore. Um, we've done a lot in terms of reducing air, air uh, uh, emission, uh, so-called, uh, uh, what do they call those days, days where you had uh, smog days. Very few and far between. Uh, cars. Uh, you know, I, it would take... Uh, it would take 17 vehicles built today to emit as much uh, NOx, SOx, and VOCs, volatile organic compounds, as a car built back in the late 70s, early 80s. Does it mean we should sit in our laurels and say it's great? No, but we, I think we should have to take into account certain things. Plastics are a reality. We don't pollute. They don't wind up in waterways. Uh, they might in other parts of the world. That's a critical issue. Uh, but it's also the very thing, the vanguard that's protected us through this damn, you know, damnable uh, pandemic that we've had. If I didn't have my PPCs and I didn't have access to, you know, uh, masks and syringes, uh, those things aren't made with hemp. So I guess I really have to come back to people and say, be realistic about what you and your prime minister are demanding. Because for a guy who doesn't know the difference between, uh, you know, a, uh, a juice box uh, and, uh, you know, a plastic that might find its way into the Ganges River is, is pretty shameful. Having said all that, uh, I think, uh, should we tax? I think what we should do is incentivize and, and get companies to move in a direction where financially it's more advantageous for them. So you have the stick or the carrot. We really know how to use the stick. Unfortunately, that stick is not being used against industry producing. It's being used against consumers. Anybody who thinks otherwise is delusional and needs meds right now. What are your thoughts on adapting? I mean, you know, if the conservative uses many arguments like, well, India's not doing jack. China's polluting their oceans, and it, it makes it all the way around the world to us. We're doing our part. We're paying through the nose for our energy to, you know, f to virtue signal across the economy and the world. You know, uh, they also say, you know, if we stopped burning carbon today, the atmosphere and the climate is going to go through its what's well, going to go through for the next few hundred years. We're, we're not going to impact it. The damage is already done. So your thoughts on some of these conservative arguments that, you know, in China's not doing anything. And w even if we stop burning fossil fuel today the climate is going to do what it's going to do and we need to learn to adapt more than anything well adaptability is fine i just you know have to look at what we what's happened in the past year the world economy has slowed down as a result of COVID, uh and we see emissions rising right so-called carbon emissions rising um in and of itself 
you know, for every argument, uh, there's a, a, obviously a counter argument and I'll leave that for a, a much bigger battle. Um, uh, you know, the, the tropical, uh, 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 tropical, uh, layer of the planet, uh, tropos troposphere, I think it's referred to as, has a lot more to do, especially around the equator in terms of de determining, uh, you know, uh, the temperatures and anything we could put into the, into the air. But I mean, it's easy to say, hey, China, you're doing your bad job and, uh, you know, they're not interested in helping while Canada should, you know, should uh, smother itself in trying to achieve, you know, a reduction of 1.6% uh, percent of all the emissions and then the so-called ar argument, oh, but per capita, it's much higher. Look, we live in the coldest country in the world. We're colder than Russia. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it isn't done by hoping that you can put, uh, as uh, our federal government has invested in, if you believe it or not, solar panels in the high Arctic, where sun for two thirds of the year is virtually non-existent. Real brilliant move. I think we have to look at uh, a variety of, of, of sources. And you know what, this is not new. Having this discussion is a little bit like being disingenuous to the previous generation that's gone before us. We've created like hydroelectric. We've created nuclear. We've created natural gas. We've created clean coal. We've created sequestered clean coal. I mean, there's a thousand ways in which we have produced energy in this country, but the variety, the diversity of mix uh, is coming along. My son bought a 2021 Ford Bronco for him and his young family, a three cylinder vehicle that carries and does as much as an eight cylinder did 10, 12 years ago. I'm only using that as an example because perhaps my bias working many years ago in public relations for the automotive industry, Toyota Canada in particular. And yes, uh, I do remember the uh, uh, the tsunami, which we introduced as a model car in Canada. You'll know today is the Prius mm -hmm. that happened well while I was there. And so my sense is that I think we have to allow industry and we have to allow these things to take place and we can incentivize those things to take place. But what we don't need is to go and spend billions of dollars blowing our brains out saying we have to give rich people, you know, a subsidy to buy a Tesla, a Tesla, which they're only going to trade in in four or five years, batteries that are made in China and which have very little in terms of a positive environmental impact for Canadians uh, and for, you know, uh, for emissions. So if we're going to get really tied up on the issue of CO2, um, we better get it right because uh, there's a very strong debate. I don't necessarily trust the uh, International Panel on Climate Change. Um, I suspect that their whole agenda is to find where there is no issue, to find anything. Hot weather, ooh, we've got a forest fire somewhere, or an earthquake, or a, a hurricane, and yeah, it's climate change. It's not. It's been going on for you know, trillions of years, billions of years. And so I get, I get, I get the point where People can be really concerned about these things, but uh, I think you know the issue of world peace and uh, uh, addressing poverty and trying to address affordability uh, and trying to improve the human condition, which is I think the pursuit of many of us, versus those who at the end of the day are saying, "Nah, this isn't just about adaptation and sustainability." I mean, very blunt, it's about population reduction, and it comes down to it. That's Malthusianism, and that's ideology that died two, three hundred years ago. I'm already sick of people revisiting that idea, but that's what they're talking about. They do not like the fact that there was no peak oil. They don't like the fact that we didn't go into a massive starvation where uh, the world would come to an end. Uh, people, two thirds of the population of Britain and North America would have no food and then we would have uh, temperatures going through the roof. Oh, actually in the 1970s, we would have freezing uh, that would kill us. I mean, that was the, that was the, uh, that was de rigueur, as they say back uh, 30, 40 years ago. I can go at length on this, but the reality is I think uh, it's like Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, chances are you're going to wind up somewhere else. And that's where, the, unfortunately, the political scientists, not the science, but the political scientists are taking us. Amen. I love you, brother. Thank you for your time. Just on the way out, a message of hope for those of us that are so far blackpilled and have yet to clown pill. So we're just laughing at everything. We're feeling hopeless, a little suicidal, that we're never going to be able to get out from underneath big business and big government and give, give any message of hope, any light at the end of the tunnel from Dan McTeague today. <laughs> Do what I'm doing. I got no particular uh, uh, special set of uh, qualifications. Uh, Believe in what you do, have some faith in what you do and know that uh, you can make a difference. And uh, one person can indeed make a massive difference if they apply themselves and, uh, and have at the end of the day, 
the betterment of their neighbor uh, as their objective. And I don't mean that to be pedantical. That's that's really what it's all about. Thank you, my friend. Uh, let's do this again when I can take you a little longer. I know you got more appointments, so I want to get you out of here on time. But thanks very much, Dan McTeague, uh, for your time. That was great. All right, thanks, bye. Jim. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. That's Dan McTeague. If you need him, thank you, Dan. Uh, affordable energy for Canadians. Canadians for affordable energy.ca. Here's his fake book group right here. Sorry, Dan, I did cut you hard. Usually I like <laughs> Sometimes I don't talk to my people after the interviews. I just got him hard. He's got an interview to go to at 1 o'clock, so I want to get him out on time. It's 12.55 p.m. EST on your local time if you're in my area of the world. Here's where he's at on Twitter at Gas Price Wizard Dan McTeague on Twitter twitter.com slash gas price wizard and well I mean who uses LinkedIn anymore come on now I'll get this uploaded it'll be on the podcast on iTunes Stitcher and all the other platforms within the hour good night now <laughs>